Welcome to the fifth presentation in the Trees Touch and Valley by Wood Science Center virtual conference series. This conference series was initiated to contribute to scientific discussion in a time where conferences have been canceled due to the COVID-19 outbreak. The full program is found at the Trees Touch webpage. My name is Josefine Nilegård, and today we have Gunnar Westman, who will present surface modification of nanocrystalline cellulose. Gunnar is professor in organic chemistry at Chalmers with a special interest in nanocelluloses. He's one of the PIs in Vandenberg Wood Science Center and deputy director of tree research. You in the audience can interact and ask questions to Gunnar or comment via YouTube chat function. And the questions will be answered after presentation that will last approximately 30 minutes, but you can type in your questions during the presentation. And with that, I hand over to Gunnar. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be a part of uh, this uh, event. So um, <clears throat> I will um, talk a little bit about an, a chemical modification of nanocrystalline cellulose. And uh, outlined is that I will give you a brief introduction overview of the field. Then I will go into the chemical modification or the hydrolysis of C and C and the characterization. And then after that, I will present some work that we are doing here at Chalmers when it comes to chemical modification and especially chemical modification of the sulfate groups of the uh, C and C surfaces. And then there will be some um, slides on where we have made composites of these uh, chemically modified CNCs. So, um, see, now we have, uh, yes. When you search the literature on nanocrystalline cellulose, uh, you find approximately 1,000 articles if you search Web of Science. And if you do sort of um, a little bit organization of all these articles, you will see that there are sort of four main areas uh, where you find publications. There is about characterization, there are composites, mm -hmm. development and production, and physical properties of these materials. And as you see, the characterization that we have as the green ones are connected both to physical properties, development, production, and composites. Whereas the area of composites is a little bit by itself and has sort of a good connection with publications on characterization. Then if we narrow this down a little bit, so we look at nanocrystalline cellulose and modification, you find um, approximately a little bit more than 100 articles in the area. And they are extremely divided into two areas. One of them is sort of characterization and one of them is sort of application. You don't find that much on composites there. You've, what you find is more biodegradability and biocompatibility of these materials. So if you work on chemical modification of nanocrystalline cellulose, or if you want to go into the field, it's sort of not that you can find sort of a direct area where lots of people are working. It seems more like people are working a little bit here and there in this area. So when it comes to preparation of nanocrystalline cellulose, um, it's done by acid hydrolysis of a cellulose source. And the cellulose source could be any kind of cellulose material like filter paper, pulp, cotton, or microcrystalline cellulose. Then um, you need to have an acid. And if you use uh, sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid, you will obtain a charged uh, nanocrystalline cellulose. And these nanocrystalline cellulases usually form stable water suspensions. Whereas if you use hydrochloric acid, oxalyl chloride, or iron trichloride, it will form a neutral nanocrystalline 
metal in cellulose. And these usually sort of precipitate out in water solutions. And then when you perform the reactions, uh, it's usually important to keep control on temperature, acid concentration, and the ratio of cellulose to acid in the solution. So for example, if you use filter paper, there be, may be some reaction conditions that are optimal and compared to microcrystalline cellulose where it may be complete different reactions, uh, conditions that are used. Then also we have seen, and I assume other have seen that also, but not that much is published on it. It's also important to be to keep control of the temperature profile and also having sort of considering the stirring of the reaction. For example, if you prepare my uh, non-crystalline cellulose from hydrochloric acid, uh, we have seen an extremely big difference if you have a good stirring or if you do it in a larger scale where you don't have sort of the grinding effect from the stirrer bar. Uh, towards the glass vessel. And also when you perform the reaction in uh, sulfuric acid, if you add the pulp at room temperature and heat up to 45 degrees, or if you have uh, the solution preheated to 45 degrees and then add the cellulose material, you will obtain two different types of non-crystalline cellulose, or they have completely different property to each other. That at least what we have found uh, when we have performed these reactions. Then when we do the reaction in sulfuric acid or as in phosphoric acid, uh, I have said that we form stable water suspensions. And these stable water suspensions form a controlled or organized structures like these ones. And then you can see, so you have the crystals laying in different layers and these will give the material optical properties. And then if you take to the bulk, you have lots of these as shown here, and they will give you sort of these uh, color properties of the material. Then going a little bit into the details to make uh, sulfated non-crystalline cellulose. Uh, what presented here is when we make it from five to 500 gram batches. So we start with the um, cellulose material. Usually we start from microcrystalline cellulose because it's convenient, but it also works well on the pulp. So we start with 64% uh, sulfuric acid that we have seen when it comes to larger scale reactions, we need to prepare it two days of ahead of the reaction. So we have an equilibrium between sulfuric acid and water. We preheat the solution, add the cellulose material and let it stir for two hours at 45 degrees. And during that time, it will be a little bit brownish. Then we dilute the material, twice amount of uh, water, let it stir for five minutes and then do centrifugation and redispersion and dilution with water and centrifugation three times. And after that, we do dialysis, let the conductivity go down to below five microsiemens, and then it's a matter of just sonication and you have your stable non-crystalline cellulose solution. And that solution, you can of course freeze dry if you want. What we have seen or found out here at our, our lab is that if we take this solution directly from here and then make a film of it, it will form a transparent and in with AF or sorry, in the same picture, it will look like this. If we then instead take this solution, freeze dry it, redisperse it back to the same concentration and then make a film of it, we will obtain this material. And from this SEM, it looks like this. And we are not really sure what's happening here, but it's a clear effect that we see here. Then when we have the 
nanocrystalline cellulose or the sulfated nanocrystalline cellulose. Uh, we do some characterization of it. We do it with AFM, SETA potential, conductometric titration, and TGA to just sort of get the size of the material and the size of the, or, and the charge of the surface. The conductometric titration uh, we do in triplicate to get sort of an average value. And from that, we can calculate the sort of the sulfur content of the material or the sulfuric acid content on the material from these equations here. And here I must stress, it's extremely important to have a freshly prepared sodium hydroxide solution. So it's not has been standing for a long time and absorbed carbonate because then it will give completely wrong values. Then when we have the surface charge or the content of sulfuric acid groups on the surface and combine that with data from AFM, we can calculate the number of sulfate groups on the surface. And when we have um, a loading of, um, as we had before, we usually get sort of a substitution of 0 0.18 or every fifth of these primary hydroxyl groups is a sulfuric as, or a sulfate group here on the surface. And you can read more about this in the article here by Ely and the man in from nanoscale. But that's important to know how many sulfate groups we have on the surface. Mm -hmm. Then when it comes to chemical modification, uh, we um, usually assume that we only have the alcohol group sitting here on the surface. Unfortunately, we quite often neglect that we have these sulfate groups. But if we stick to the alcohol groups, they can be modified in sort of traditional ways like esterification, eterification, and oxidation. And when it comes to oxidation, it has been <clears throat> presented or published both where the primary alcohol is oxidized to carboxylic acid and where the diols here is oxidized to a dialdehyde. And when we have done, so this is sort of what you, sorry, it's going by itself here by some reason. <clears throat> and then you can also, but there is only a few articles on that where you can do re uh, reactions on the reducing end group here. So the reducing end groups is sort of, it could be both in the closed form and in the open form where you have an aldehyde and that sort of lays in equilibrium with the hemiacetal here. So on that one, we can do aminations. And then what we have done is that we have worked with alkylation of the sulfate group. So you have the primary alcohols, the secondary alcohols, the reducing end group, and the sulfate groups that you can work on. And there is a good reference from 2013 where you can find a lot of sort of uh, material on chemical modification of nanocellulose. So when we started this quite a long time ago, uh, 2008, 2009, uh, we thought that um, it's, we need to modify the, chem, the nanocrystalline cellulose in some way. And we were not sort of, we stick to what all others do. So do reactions in organic solvent and then we thought DMS was good because it's, uh, it's soluble in water. So we could have a little bit of water left. They sold the reagents in DMS add and do the reaction. And then we had this idea that we should use one group, chloracetyl chloride, to do sort of a handle on the nanocrystalline cellulose and then add an A mine. So we got this sort of uh, charge M amino groups, and that will give a sort of a set of different non-crystalline cellulose. The reaction seems to work very well, but then when we dig a little bit deeper into the details, 
we realize that we actually destroyed the nanocrystalline cellulose. So here is an AFM picture of the nanocrystalline cellulose. So we see clearly the rods here. But when we have done the chemical modification, we have a picture that looks like this. So it seems like we sort of destroy or expand this crystal structure here. And the explanation we have for that is that when we substitute the surface, all of these sort of polymer change will be peeled off. So slowly, slowly we degrade the nanocrystalline cellulose. So from that, we thought we may do actions in water instead. And when it comes to do reactions in water, we can't do sort of have the same set of mo chemical modifications. There are just a limited number of reactions that actually works well in water. And then also the classical SN2 reaction as we organic chemists talk quite a lot about is not correct in water. There are other mechanisms occurring there. So if we look a little bit on this, first, when it comes to the mechanism how reactions works in water, as I said, they don't follow the traditional SN2 reaction pathway that you may have up here. So you see we have the a, a methyl iodide and that reacts in sort of a standard way. Uh, when it's this reaction is performed in water, we also have a strong coordination of the water molecules, both to the nucleophile and to the electrophile. So it's a complete different reaction mechanism when we do reactions in water. So as a consequence, you can't just take your organic chemical textbook and sort of copy paste reactions from there and think that they will work fine in water. Then also when we do reactions in water, the water coordinate and we have both to the reagents, as I said, and also to the surface here. And that may affect the reactivity of the reactions. And then the third part that is sort of a challenge here is we have the sulfate groups. We usually talk about them um, when we discuss sort of that the CNCs uh, form stable water suspensions. But when it comes to chemical modification, we sort of neglect them completely and just look at on what can, what can be done on the hydroxyl groups. And we have done the same mistake. Uh, so this is a uh, reference to our first publication on chemical modification of nanocrystalline cellulose. It's from 2008 when uh, Marima Hassani was a PhD student and she did an internship together with Emily Creston and Derek Gray uh, in Canada. And there they were looking at sort of chemical modification of nanocrystalline cellulose with aptamac in basic conditions. And the reaction worked well and smooth and we had good characterization of that. But at that time, we never thought about the sulfate groups that actually play a role in many of the reactions. So trying to take this further and looking at chemical reactions in water, we started to look at what type of chemical reactions do occur in water and on cellulose. And there are two sort of areas where you can look into there. One is to use sort of um, uh, wet, look at wet strange agents. And there is a wet strange agent called cumene that is sort of uh, the material that you get from a secondary amine and epichlorohydrine that will give you the amino chlorohydrine and then acetidium chloride. So these two are sort of considered to be in equilibrium with each other. And on this sort of wet strange reactions, there is a really good uh, paper, or I would say a chapter by Lindström, Bogberg and Larsson that you have here. Uh, it's from a research symposium in Cambridge, 2005. It's a 
almost 100 pages or more than 100 pages, but it's a really good paper. So I strongly recommend that. And then also there are some publications in the literature where they have functionalized carboxylic acids on cells with this cumin. So using this acetidinium moiety and then that reacts with the carboxylic acid group here. So with that background, we thought that we should look, or at the same time as the publication from 2012, we were working with hemicellulosis. And we were doing hydrophobization of hemicellulosis. And one way to do that was to do an oxidation of the primary alcohols on the hemicellulose with tempo and the co-catalyst vibe. And then we had the carboxylic acid that we functionalized with different acetidinium salts. So we thought this reaction was working, uh, or we saw that this reaction was working really well. So we thought to adapt this sort of reaction acetidinium salt to sulf sulfate groups. And we tried that with in DMS to toline, and it seems to work very good also. So from the characterization of the material, we looked at the SATA potential, so the surface charge of the unmodified uh, CNC, that was minus 71.7. Upon reaction, as expected, the SATA potential goes closer to zero. Uh, and also when we look at the um, pH of the solution. So this one, the nanocrystalline cellulose has a pH of 2.7 as a water suspension. Whereas when it's chemically modified, it has a pH of around five, P, P, a pH of five approximately. And then also a little bit surprisingly, we realized that they actually become more thermal stable upon chemical modification. And the explanation we have so far for that is that when we modify the, the sulfate groups on the surface, we will block these sulfate groups for form, from forming sulfuric acid, which can happen here. So here it can form sulfuric acid upon heating and the formed sulfuric acid will start to degrade the nanocrystalline cellulose. Whereas here, when it's blocked as a diester, it will not be able to form sulfuric acid. And as a consequence, it will become more thermal stable. And during this time, we also looked at the solid state NMR on the samples. And there, there, there is a technique called close cross polarization solid state and the more where we actually look at sort of the solid material and the flexible material and i'm not sure if you see that should be here so here you see small peaks and that's from the sort of the flexible material part of the molecule and the flexible part is what we have here so this one is a solid material and this part we can see as a flexible or almost soluble material. And then with the cross polarization technique, we can see both of these parts here. And the reason why these signals are so weak is that we only have sort of 20% surface coverage of these groups. So there are lots of signals from the solid nanocrystalline cellulose and just a weak sort of signal from that one. But that we had as a proof that we actually have the chemical modification. So the solid state NMR together with the TGA and these values here, both set up potential and the pH of the system, we had as an evidence that we have this conjugation here. Then we thought we need to find processes so we actually can scale up this. And one part of this is to do direction in water. 
so far we have been quite stuck to DMSO and toluene solutions. And another part is to make acetidinium salt of good quality and in high yield, of course. So when it comes to perform their action in water, we started uh, two master thesis projects on that. And one that was really successful was by Robin Larson that when he was looking at sort of chemical modification of nanocrystalline cellulose with acetidinium salt, and then taking these derivatives and mix them with PLA and to make composites. One in that project was to look at different solvent systems here for directions for the chemical modification. And then Robin found out that the reaction actually works very well in water at 80 degrees by stirring or yeah, reacting it overnight at 80 degrees. So that make, made us of course happy. And then we have continued with these sort of process by doing the reaction in water. And then we have also a publication uh, on that. And then when we had these results, we thought that we need to optimize it even further. And then since we know that the TGA of the material can be used as a sort of indication if we have free sulfate groups or not, or to sort of monitor the reaction progress of the reaction. So then we started to do a set of reactions with different amounts of acetidinium salt to uh, non-crystalline cellulose. So if we don't have any acetidinium salt present in the reaction flask, the TJ will look like this as it is for unmodified DNC. And then we started to have one to one mole equivalent of acetidinium salt towards the number of uh, glucose units on the surface of nanocellulose. And then we see this increase in um, thermal stability. And the conclusion for that is that we sort of have modified the sulfate groups on the surface. And then we continue to decrease the, decrease the amount of acetidinium salt and went down to 0.25 mole equivalents of acetidinium salt compared to number of high glucose units on the surface. And we still see that we have a good thermal stability. And the conclusion we have is that we have substituted all uh, sulfate groups on the cellular surface. And these reactions were done at uh, for 24 hours or overnight, so maybe somewhere between 12 to 24 hours. And then we started to look at the reaction time. And then we found that even after two hours, we have good thermal stability of the material. So with the reaction for say two hours, you have the reaction done. So in going from DMS of water where we had one-to-one -one mole equivalent of acetidinium salt towards the number of glucose units on the surface and running the reaction for 24 hours. We can now have one-fourth to one-fifth of acetidinium salt and the reaction is over in two hours. So we see this as a really good improvement of the reaction conditions. Then the next part is to have acetidinium salt of good quality. And um, what is known is that if you take in diamine and epichlorohydrine in a solvent, then you will most often get a mixture of acetidinium salt and this chlorohydrine. And if we take this mixture and react with nanocrystalline cellulose, whereon we have sulfuric acid groups. The sulfuric acid group will react with acetidinium salt, forming sort of the first linker group on the C and C. Then this nitrogen here is reactive and may react with the chlorohydrin that we have here 
So we start to build up some kind of oligomer or long chain here on the surface. And of course, if you have both of these in direction mixture, you're not sure if this is what you have or if you have something with the polymer linkers on. So what we were looking for was a method to get this in pure form without sort of the chlorohydrin interaction mixture. And for that, we had uh, two to three international students working during summer here. And to conclude their work, we found out that if we do this reaction in stepwise, so we first take the dialkyleamine and epichlorohydrin in isopropanol, only the open form will be formed here. So only the chlorohydrin will be formed. And this reaction goes almost in quantitative yield. Then we take this mixture here in isopropanol, change to acetonitrile and solvent, and then add sodium bicarbonate to the reaction and let it heat for two hours. And then we will obtain pure or almost pure acetidinium salt in 85 to 92% yields roughly. And then, so now with this procedure, we have both a fairly efficient way to uh, do the chemical modification and we have the acetidinium salt in, of good quality, which is good of course. So then when we have this, then it's just a matter of starting to make derivatives and start to find application for them. So parallel with this work, we have looked at making composites of these modified C and Cs. And this is one of the early results that we have from that. So where we still were using DMS and toluene as the uh, solvent system for doing direction. At this time, we were not aware of that direction actually works in water. Also in the beginning, we were very concerned about the hydroxyl group that you have on the acetidinium salt. So we, to be on the safe side or to eliminate any side directions, we did the methylation of that. So in the pre early work from our, us, we always have this uh, hydroxyl group methylated, both because we thought it could be do some strange uh, intramolecular re or reactions, and also because we wanted to increase the hydrophobicity as much as possible. So in one of the early work, we um, mix these modified nanocrystalline cellulose with the uh, LDPE, low density polyethylene. And this is how uh, low density polyethylene looks like if you put it through a minor, mini extruder and make sort of uh, dog bones of it. And this is how it looks if you take LDPE and unmodified CNC. And man, as mentioned before, the unmodified C and Cs are not thermal stable. So they start to degrade when you process them in the minor extru mini extruder, and then you obtain sort of this black material. Whereas if you have chemically modified C and Cs, they will form these nice dog bones here. And uh, highest amount of CNC we could get into the LDP at that stage was around 3% roughly. And these uh, test bars here show sort of different mechanical properties compared to um, the pure LDP or the reference LDP. But at this time, the sort of main focus was actually to make composites and try to get as high amount of C and C as possible in the material. And from the TGA, we see that they have the thermal stability as we have seen before. 
So we thought this was sort of a really good starting point for something to dig further into. Uh, and then we sort of started to look at other um, polymers like uh, ethylene acrylic acid and uh, modified CNCs. And here we worked with uh, some of the linkers that have been some kind of reference for our research. We have the morpholin group, we have the dihexyl group, and we have the diallyl group. And the reason why we are working with these three uh, different type of linkers is because in the morpholin, we have both the nitrogen and oxygen that can form hydrogen bonds to things in the environment, like other non-crystalline particles, or if you have hydroxyl groups in the composite. The dihexyl group we use because it was extremely easy to make in the beginning, and then it gave us sort of a good hydrophobization of the material. And the diallyl we have chosen because we can, if we succeed with chemical modification with the diallyl, we can continue the chemical modification of these two allyl groups. Either we can do sort of polymerization of them or we can do oxidation or addition here. So we see this as a really interesting tool for develop, developing further. Then when we made these uh, composites with the uh, CNC and EAA, we got sort of three different uh, visual or appearance of the material. The morpholin is always slightly yellow, whereas the dihexyl and the diallyl are almost transparent. And we think the yellow color in the morpholin is due to an oxidation of this nitrogen here. So you can see it's as a, an oxygen group, an oxygen sitting linked to the nitrogen here, like we have in N oxides. Uh, <clears throat> and then these derivatives, I have seen, shown this uh, fairly many times now. We have the thermal stability or increase in thermal stability upon uh, functionalization. But a little bit surprising when we looked at the thermal stability of the composites, so the mixture of EAA and mite CNC, we saw that they all started to degrade at sort of 140, 150 degrees. And it didn't matter if we have unmodified CNC or we have the chemically modified CNC. That, that was sort of a big surprise for us. But after a little bit thinking and discussions in the group, we realized that the EA that we have is actually a basic. So we think that the carboxylate that we have react with the sulfate groups and start to generate sulfuric acid that starts to break down uh, the C and C structure here. So that's the re reason behind sort of the degradation. So way to confirm or prove this, we made a mixture with EAA that we first had neutralized. So it was sort of around pH seven. And for these materials, we could not see any sort of degradation of the material. So now it behaves as expected. We have degradation, this color of the unmodified CNC, but as soon as we chemically modify them, they become, uh, they keep sort of the stability. And then if we look at the molecular or the mechanical properties of the material, we, we see a, a strong effect or at least an effect from the chemically modified uh, CNCs compared to um, the, the reference or the sort of the EAA by itself and untreated CNC. 
And here we see when we have zero percent of C and C in the composite, one percent and ten percent. So there is a strong increase in E model for these materials. And when looking at the mechanical loss factor, we see that we have the lines laying close to the matrix sort of in the profile. And that's an indication of good interface between the linker or the C and C derivatives and the polymer, which of course make us happy. Uh, and then just to show you, we have done quite a lot of mechanical uh, in characterization of the material. And one interesting thing in this table, if we really dig into it, is that the morpholin seems to have a very high effect at low concentration. And then when it comes to the high concentration of modified C and C, it's not that strong the effect from morpholin. And this we thought was a little bit interesting. And the reason behind this, we think is due to that we have, can build up hydrogen bonds, both between the nitrogen and the oxygen in the morpholin structure. And also that we can maybe build up structures like these between the, the matrix and the linker and we also have these types of coordination to the oxygen here. We don't have any sort of characterization proof for this, but this is sort of the hypothesis or the schematic picture we have as an explanation to the high effect at the low concentration. That sort of this group helps to uh, coordinate to the matrix and other C and Cs in in the system. So um, then when have done this and we can sort of do chemical modification of C and C, we can make composites and we have sort of built up a platform for this. We started to think about doing sort of systematic studies and what about sort of the hydrophobization of C and C. So then in one project, we took made acetidinium salt with two different R groups here, but the total sum of number of carbons in these two are equal to 12. So we make the linkers where we have one carbon and 11 carbon chain, three carbon, nine carbons, six carbons and six carbons. So from as sort of a hydrophobization perspective, they have the same number of carbons. And from that, you can assume that should, they should behave sort of similar to each other. So if you look into polymer chemistry, there is quite a lot of discussions or publications on the branch effect. So if you have a branching of the system that will sort of uh, affect the mechanical properties and the physiological physical properties of the material. So in a similar way we thought that if we have these two groups here, if one of them is a methyl group, it will have sort of a small area where it can rotate and then we have the long tail, the 11, and that sort of have their conical Brownian motion where it can rotate. Whereas if we have two linkers that are six carbon each, they will more be sort of an oblate structure. So it will take up a broader area, whereas this will be sort of more like a beehive or what we can call it. So this is what sort of what we had as the back ground knowledge or hypothesis is when we started this and see how they behaved. So, and one way to see how they behave is by rheology. And from the rheology, we thought that the long chain, so the C1, C11, 
had sort of a loss modulus and then sort of a bump here. And this bump here is, um, is usually explained as there is some kind of entanglement in the system. And for the C3, C9, we see a smaller entanglement. And for the 6, 6 and uh, unmodified, we of course doesn't see this at all. So um, this sort of a little bit naive picture of the system seems at least to fit to what we see from the rheological measurements here. So we can see that one stretching out a little bit further from the surface compared to the C6, C6. And since it stretched out a little bit longer to the surface, it will form sort of, or have a higher probability, probability to entangle with each other. Then this project was done together with Roland Kadar. And the Roland Kandar built a system where we can actually film what's happening in the Rio meter. So he has a light source and then a camera so he can actually look at the material here. And with that technique, we started to look at the material. Sorry for the sound here. But you see, you have seen color changes in the material. And this is for unmodified CNC. And then we thought we could do, thought it would be interesting to do the same thing for the chemically modified materials. And then we saw that for the 11.1, we see a clear blue color almost from the beginning when we start this shearing. Whereas for this, 6-6, six, six, we don't see it. And for not unmodified C and C, we don't see it. So we think here that we must have some kind of ordered structure here in the system, which was a little bit of surprise and also very interesting, of course. And then we come up sort of, how do we continue with this? How do we explain the aggregation? And how do we actually visualize the chemically modified C and C. Now it's very obvious that these sort of cartoonic pictures of nanocrystalline cellulose doesn't sort of are relevant. They are good to explain what chemical modifications you do, but when it comes to alignment and aggregation, we can't use these models. So, and then if you start to try to make sort of three-dimensional pictures from these cartic ones, it will just be messy and complicated. And then if you say that you have a nanocrystalline cellulose and you have a surface layer of hydrophobization agent, it will not give you something either. So the, one of the few answers forward is to use computer modeling. So then we started the collaboration with uh, Igor Sosolenko at Linköping University. And he and his group has done molecular modeling of these systems. And then they have done modeling on where we have a low degree of substitution. So 0 0.07, 0 0.2, sorry, 0 0.07, 0 0.2 and 0 0.5. And this is what sort of the one in the middle is in agreement what we have from sort of in the lab. And now with these techniques, we can start to look at what's happening sort of in a more realistic way. So it's, that's been a great step forward to start the collaboration with Sosolenko's group at Linköping University. So with this, we think we sort of have started to build a little bit of understanding platform. From now, it's just a matter to take it forward. And there are different ways to do that. One is to do more chemical derivatives and study them, and then sort of both sort of characterization and the rheology. And from this, we may find some structure properly property relationships in these systems. So far, we don't have any mathematical formulas for that. 
And then also now with sort of a convenient water-based method, we can start to do a little bit of large scale production of these materials. So this is what we are aiming for in the future or for the next year to come. And then just to show you what we have working on for the moment, we have done a set or maybe too many uh, chemically modified derivatives. And now we are ongoing with the rheological measurement of these. Uh, for chemical characterization of the materials, we have also started to look at FTIR in details. There are two peaks at 804 and 815 reciprocal centimeters. That is for the sulfate groups, both the free sulfate and the ester sulfate here. So we look at the ratio between them and has as an extra sort of evidence for the chemical reaction as well. So this is where we are now. Lots of molecules to go through, but we are working on it. And hopefully in a few years from now, we have some interesting results from this. With that, I would like to thank you all for attending this webinar. Uh, my thank you goes to Wallenberg Wood Science Center, where we have KTH, Chalmers and Linköping University. Three search, of course, for organizing these types of webinars. And then Göteborg University or Swedish NMR Center here at Gothenburg, where we have done some of the NMR studies. And here you see some of the people that have been involved in the project. So thanks from me for to all of you. And, thank and then you I hand over to Josephine. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much, Gunnar. Uh, don't forget, you who are listening, that you can ask questions via the live chat. Uh, I take the opportunity then to ask you a question, Gunnar, mm -hmm. um, about the maximum uh, amount of CNCs in the composites. Or so far, uh, you got up to 10%, if yes, I understand correct. correctly. The, uh, what would you think would be the optimum? Is it around 10 or would, would you like to increase it more? Or? Uh, we are aiming for higher contents. Um, we would like to get as high as possible, or quite frankly, we would take the dye allyl and make it into a composite by itself. So it will be 100% of that material. Uh, the, to be aware of or keep in mind is also sort of the mechanical properties of the material. So it's not just a matter of making as much or having a composite of as much C and C as possible in it. It's also a matter of having some kind of mechanical properties that can compete what's with what's on the market. And we have so far uh, no other question. Um, so I take the opportunity just to show um, the continuation of this uh, conference series. Today we then have Gunnar Westman um, and then we take a short Easter break uh, and we'll be back on Thursday the 16th of April with Lars Berglund. Uh, but on Tuesday the 14th there will be a docent lecture at KTH where Laurie McKee will have uh, a dozen lecture on the, uh, the untapped potential of the soil microbiota for energy and materials. So don't miss that. It's a separate link for that. You can find it at the KTH website and you can find it at Tree Search website. And it starts at 10 sharp. And uh, still no questions. You were very clear. <laughs> it was a very interesting uh, seminar. Thank you, Gunnar, for your presentation. Mm -hmm.
And thank and, you for attending the webinar. And thank you so much, you who were listening. And if you missed any of the other previous presentations or, or want to watch this again, uh, you can do it on YouTube's uh, on Teresa's YouTube channel where we have the presentations available. So thank you very much and see you on the next presentation.